Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all. Welcome to this service at Weedy Community Church. My name's Jemima, and I'm on the leadership here. So I'll be leading the service this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm finding this lockdown harder than the first one, perhaps because it just never seems to come to an end. And I'm hoping this morning that we can take comfort in knowing the care our Father has, has for us. So this morning we'll be continuing, continuing to think about the gifts of the spirit and Al will be talking to that to us about that later. The way this service will run is that we will we're going to watch and sing some songs. There's going to be some notices and then the youth will leave to join their own Zoom call. Um, and if you've got um, kids, um, there is a pack for them. I'm just going to paste it in in the chat. Um, so if you if you haven't come across that, please pick that up. You can print it out and do it during the service or any time during the week, to be honest. And there it is there in chat. So please grab it if you haven't already. So we're going to start by singing um, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. And in the first verse, it says we are pilgrims in this barren land. And I think at this moment, this world can feel very barren. So let's turn to God and rely on his strength as we sing this now. And please stand if this helps you, please. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin. Now we're just going to take a moment to think about a passage from Isaiah 41. So on your screen in a second, you will see, I hope, um, that passage from Isaiah 41. Um, so I'm now going to read that to you. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its father's corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. 
I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So I'm going to skip to the next slide. Okay, and this is just verse 10. And I'm focusing on just those particular things that, that God says about us. So I've highlighted them. You'll see they're in bold. So he says, I am with you. I am your God. He will be with us. He will be our God. He will strengthen us. He will help us. He will uphold us with his righteous right hand. So as you look at those statements, those phrases, maybe there's one that, that stands out to you. Maybe there's one that you need to hold on to right now. So just take a moment here just to mull over that phrase in your mind. And then I'm going to pray for us. Father, I know that I am often afraid. I'm afraid of what will happen next. I'm afraid of the things that I don't know how to do. I'm afraid for my family and friends. Father, be with us because we need you. Father, I am often, so often dismayed. There is so much pain and suffering in the world and so much that is our that is wrong. Father, be our God, because we are lost without you. Father, we are weak. Strengthen us. Father, help us. We so much need your help. Father, uphold us. We lean on your righteous right hand. Father, we bring you the big things, the big scary things in our lives, the spiritual things, the things about our walk with you that maybe aren't quite right, the everyday things, the things that are bothering us right now, the things that will be there tomorrow, all these things that are on our hearts and minds, we bring them to you. Father, we commit ourselves, our whole lives into your hands. And we thank you that we can always trust you. Amen. We are now going to sing Faithful One So Unchanging. Let us lean on the one who is always faithful, who does not change, because in the storm he is the anchor. Thanks for that, Kevin. We're now going to carry on by singing The Lord's My Shepherd. The chorus says, And I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me, lead me home.
So let us keep on remembering the help that our God will give us. Thank you for that, Kevin. So hopefully you will have been able to look at the Faith Matters videos that we've done on the website. So these are short videos which talk about some parts of our faith. And we've been um, seeing some of them on Sunday mornings, just so you can see what they are. And hopefully you can um, put them on social media or on by email, send them around to people you know who would benefit from, from watching them. Um, so what we are going to do now is going to watch one um, that relates particularly to the women's breakfast that we had recently. This is Naomi speaking about faith in death. So please listen to this and remember as much as you can, share it um, to people who, who, could, who could benefit from seeing it. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Whilst on my medical elective, I boarded a bus to travel the narrow winding roads of the Himalayas at the foothills. The front, just behind the driver's the front, seat, just behind was a the sign driver's which read, was a sign "Life is which uncertain. Read, Life is uncertain. Is sure. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus?" In recent months, as we've in heard daily months, the grim statistics daily of the grim grim illness from COVID-19, we've been reminded that the certainty that we will face death is an unavoidable truth. Conversations with some of my patients have visited a recurring theme. I'm afraid theme. of death. I'm afraid of death. Fear of death is natural. Fear of death is well, natural. I suppose it's a f well, it's I suppose finality, it's a finality, and it's, it's a unknownness, unknownness that makes it, and it's so. a knownness that makes we it cannot so. talk with those who we cannot died talk with those who like died to know feels. what it's like or how it so feels. Why, as the notice so on why, the bus suggested, as the notice on the bus suggested, does knowing Jesus change the picture? Knowing Jesus change the picture? Knowing Jesus. I'm knowing no Jesus, longer bound by I'm a fear no of death. Bound by a fear because of death. I do know someone because who has died. I do know someone who has who passed has died, through death, who has passed and through into death. eternal life, and into eternal life from the Bible, and from through the Bible. Holy Spirit, and through I Holy know Spirit. that Jesus' death, I know that Jesus' means death and resurrection, not in fear, fear of death, death, not in fear of death, of heaven, but in hope of heaven. What is heaven? What is Revelation? The last book in the Revelation, the last gives us something of a picture. Gives us something. Heaven is light. Heaven Lit with is Jesus light. brightness. Lit with Jesus brightness. Heaven is abundant. It's Heaven royal. is abundant. It's royal. Revelation chapter twenty. Revelation chapter tells us that one. there, tells God us will be that there. with His people. God will be and with will be His their people. God and will be there. He will God. wipe away every tear from their eyes. away every tear from There'll their be no eyes. more death. There'll or be no more death or crying or, mourning, or pain. Or crying or pain. As I walk with Jesus in this, as life, I walk with Jesus, I understand a bit more. I understand a bit more. How much more wonderful? How much more wonderful heaven will be? Than what I know now. So although the unknowns so of dying, although the unknowns when of it dying, will be, how when I might it will die, be, make me how uneasy. I might die, make me uneasy. Death itself is not a fearful Death prospect. Death itself is not a fearful prospect. It will be the moment that my hope of heaven moment is fulfilled. My hope of heaven is fulfilled. Thank you for that. As I said before, please do share that around. So we're now going to um, have a notice, and then the kids will go out. So um, just to remind you that on the 24th of February, that's not next um, Wednesday, but the Wednesday following, um, there'll be an all church um, meeting. That's a forum. So please do everyone come along to that. And that will be following on, on some of the um, life in the spirit um, topics um, that we've been hearing about recently. Um, so that's the notice for you. Um, so. Just to remind you again, I'm going to stick that in chat. OK, it's still there. Um, so I just put the link to the kids pack. So if you've not um, got that already, grab that and, and go for it. And if you are a youth, then this is the time to head out and go into your session that you have there. So go wave goodbye to Brandon at this point. All right, so I'll give them everyone a moment to kind of readjust and move around those that, that need to. Um, we are now going to um, hear about 
from one of our mission partners. And so Jane um, is now going to introduce to us a video from CAP. Yes, as most of us know, Jill Eubank is with Christians Against Poverty, uh, CAP for short, uh, which is one of the agencies that we as a church support uh, but financially by prayer. Um, and we're just gonna have a three minute video which gives us a great um, overview of what CAP is all about uh, so that we can pray uh, more intelligently for CAP. Uh, some of us will recognize who the person is who's uh, speaking on this. So straight into the video. Hello, I'm Andrew Johnson and I'm a member of Headington Baptist Church. I've lived in Oxford for over 20 years now. And about a year and a half ago, I joined Christians Against Poverty <coughs> as a centre manager here in Oxford. I love the work of CAP. About 25 years ago, God started this organisation and I believe ordained it to address one of the biggest needs and issues that we have in our society today. The issue of unmanageable, de un unmanageable debt. We have about 9 million people in the UK who are struggling with this issue. And what I love about CAP is that it gives an opportunity for Christians to get involved in a tangible and active way uh, of making a difference with those who are in poverty. Also, CAP has a very clear vision. We don't just help people with uh, their debts, but we are eager and keen to share Jesus with them at every opportunity, to draw them into the love of Christ and to see them as active disciples in our local churches. CAP doesn't just help people with debt, but we also want to prevent people from getting into debt in the first place. We have a course called CAP Money, which helps people with money management and the use of their finances. And we also run a course called Life Skills, which, as it sounds, helps people on a low income to live well and happily and healthily uh, on a low budget. We would love you to pray for us. Please would you first of all pray for our clients. It's a really tough time for them. Many of our clients aren't just struggling with debt, but actually uh, there are other causes to their debt in the first place. That might be addiction or it might be mental health issues. Please pray for them as these issues have become even more difficult during, to cope with during the pandemic. Pray that God would uh, show them uh, a way out and that they would experience his hope. And would you also pray for us we're actually uh, a team of six people with four debt coaches and we've actually got a very uh, low number of new clients at the moment. Please pray that God would bring people to us. We believe that this is mainly due to the fact that there are various uh, financial holidays and relaxations at the moment. For example, mortgage holidays and uh, we also have, for example, courts not sitting uh, so regularly. We have evictions not being legal and uh, enforcement agents not able to bang on the door. But when that happens, we expect people to, to surge forward and come and seek help. Thank you very much indeed for your partnership with us. We do appreciate working with Wheatley Community Church and we want to pray that we will continue to be strong together. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for, for bringing that to our attention and we will continue to pray for that. So if you could pick up your Bibles or your phones or whatever you use, we're now going to um, to read from 1 Corinthians 12. Um, so if you could uh, do that um, and I'm going to stick on the screen the, the text if you want to read it. You can also read it from the screen as well if that helps. Yeah. Thank you, Cyril. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. The different types of gifts but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works in all men. 
Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different types of tongues. And to still another, interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one, just as he determines. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Thanks, Cyril. That's much appreciated. Um, we're now gonna, I'm now going to hand over to Al, who will speak to us on that. Thank you, Al. Thanks. And good morning. This is a lovely passage. Um, I, I love how Paul uses this metaphor of the body. Um, it's both a metaphor and it's, and it's actually not metaphorical as well, in the sense that we really are the body of Christ on earth. Christ is no longer physically present here in, in his body on the earth, but we are doing his works. Um, but I want to start off this morning in verse five, because what Paul describes here could just be seen as, I don't know, good management or how to be nice to each other. And I want to make the case this morning that it's anchored in something much more important than that. There are different kinds of, sorry, there are different kinds of gifts. It's verse four and five. Different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Paul usually uses God in uh, the sense of God the Father. And so here we have a Trinitarian declaration right at the beginning of what Paul's about to say. He anchors his argument in the Trinity. This is not simply human pragmatism. This is theological truth. You see, the Trinity explains that we have one God and only one God, but he exists in three persons. He is utterly one, utterly unified, and yet there is diversity within God. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a mystery. It's supposed to be a mystery. But Paul says from, from that starting point, from this perfect example of what it is to be utterly one and yet to have diversity, out of that flows what he's about to explain. And what he goes on to explain is a really amazing view of unity. So what I want to start off with this morning is what is this unity that Paul talks about and what is it not? Because Paul talks about the unity of a body together. The first thing I want to say is that it's not what we call tolerance in our society. Tolerance is a word that's really gained popularity in Western societies in the recent times and Tolerance is really a pretty low bar, isn't it? Tolerance says we'll, we'll put up with each other even though we're different. If, if you like, it's sort of tolerance in spite or, or unity in spite of diversity. 
and one of the things that people celebrate about multiculturalism is that you know we even though we're all different we we can put up with each other the vision that paul lays out here is is something that goes far beyond that so this is not tolerance that we're talking about this is not putting up with each other nor in this particular passage is it about doctrinal diversity now there are passages both in this letter and in romans particularly about matters of conscience where there might be differences um, of opinion and paul goes into how we resolve those in love or, or don't even resolve them but continue to coexist with differing opinions in love but that's also not what is in view here this is not about diversity of thinking about whether other people's gifts have value either. It's the freedom for us all to have different gifts, not the freedom to look down on other gifts. I, I explain that briefly because this is something I've observed in a, in a number of different church cultures. I've been in churches where administrative gifts are seen as unspiritual, if you like, um, the bureaucracy crowding out the room for God to move. I've seen uh, or heard comments where people have described encouragement as being woolly and not very spiritual because it lacks substance. Um, I've heard mercy givers being put down as being gushy. Um, and the thing that probably most of us have to struggle with here, uh, British cynicism, when somebody has a rise of faith and they, uh, you know, th they have faith for something to, you know, break through or something big to happen. And the, the British cynicism rises up in us and says, oh, they're immature and naive. Now, that might actually be true sometimes, but there's a, there's something in our national culture, I think, that, you know, if somebody bigs something up too much, we, we just assume that probably it's a bit overinflated. So what we're talking about here in this passage is not the freedom to, to be unified, but still to look down on other people's gifts. It's much, much better than any of those unities that we might talk about. This is a unity because of diversity. It's not we put up with each other because we, despite the fact we're different, it's we need each other to be complete. Hence Paul's choice of image. He's really, really specific in not only choosing the picture of the body of Christ, but actually laboring the point. He goes into more sort of detail and more examples of body imagery here than with pretty much any other image that he picks. The ESV study Bible, which has got fantastic study notes. If you're looking for a study Bible, top recommendation there. Their, their study notes here say this. Therefore, Paul wants the Corinthian church to understand how their unity can be enhanced by appreciating the variety of gifts God has given to them. We might think that actually unity is harder the more diversity there is. What, what the ESV study notes pick up on is that Paul is actually saying the opposite. He's saying as we understand the full variety and as we accept the full variety of what God has given to us, our unity is enhanced. But Paul is clear to acknowledge that people might not feel that way. And he lays out these two different responses that we might have either I don't need you or I don't belong. Most of us probably have a tendency to, to go one way or the other on those when we come up with somebody who is very different from us, either a sort of that those of us who struggle more with pride, and I'd probably put myself in this bracket, um, have a tendency to, to push away people who are not like us or whose, whose personality and character and gift we don't easily gel with and think we're, we're good without that, thank you very much. Other people are much more self-deprecating and they would feel like actually because I'm not like that, I don't belong. Um, and a classic one would be, you know, I, I'm not a preacher, I'm not musical, I'm particularly on a Sunday morning where those are some of the things that you see up front. So, you know, I'm, I'm really only just a participant, a, a, um, a passenger in this congregation. But actually Paul says, no, that's not what it is. We're not a group of people who need to be homogenous. We're not supposed to be all the same. And we don't want to say we don't need other people who are different. We don't want to say we don't belong because we're different. Paul goes on to point out as well, it's the, it's the kind of diversity that cries out for more breadth. Now, if you go to your GP and they examine you, they're not going to say, look, you've got a great heart and you've got healthy legs and kidneys, but don't worry about the rest. That's great. You've got you've got good, good heart, good legs, good, good kidneys. No, they'll say, look, you need to take care of your liver and your eyes and your fingers and whatever else. And Paul's choice of picture points us communally as the body 
to seek to have strength in as many areas of the spirit's working as we can. That makes us complete. So this picture of unity, I'm, I'm going to labour this point because it's really important as a starting point for everything else. This picture of unity is not in spite of difference. This picture of unity is one that says we want difference. And in the sense that he's laying it out here in, in terms of diversity of gifting, we actually want as much difference, as much variety as we can, because that makes us complete as the body of Christ. And all of this is consistent with the following chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, where the giver is God who is love. And all of these gifts are to be exercised in love, seeking to build up the body. Now, we might all have some maturing to do in what I've just laid out there, but I doubt that there's going to be any controversy in saying that we should learn to appreciate and welcome people who are, I don't know, more gifted in wisdom or administration or faith. But that unity does get tested by some of the more controversial gifts. And so I'd like to really dig in there, actually, and, and talk this one out, because this is, this is where the rubber hits the road for us as a community, I think. We've talked in a number of settings now about the fact that our vocabulary in particular can highlight and accentuate difference. Now, there are genuine differences of theological opinion within our community. And what I'm not trying to do is pretend that they don't exist. But what I'd like to do is to narrow down by, by working a bit on our vocabulary, narrow down our perceived difference to what is actually different. And to do that, I'd like to pick two of the most controversial gifts that are listed in this passage. We didn't get as far as the, the second of them, but I'd like to talk about prophecy and I'd like to talk about apostleship. So prophecy, we've already picked up in that first list. If you keep reading down 1 Corinthians 12, you'll see that Paul then says, and you know, God has placed in the church apostles and prophets and teachers, um, workers of miracles, gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, different kinds of tongues. And he goes on to say, look, do we all have that? No, absolutely not, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. What I'd like to do then is, is work through with these two gifts. What is it that I think we all believe? And I think having done that, that will leave us a much greater common ground from which to pursue this unity. Okay, so prophecy, let's start with that. First of all, let's all agree prophecy is not scripture not in the New Testament, not now. In the New Testament, there are some people who prophesy and it is recorded in scripture, but there are many, many more who don't. Just the fact that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and saying, when people prophesy, it should be like this, or don't too many people prophesy at once, indicates that there's a whole bunch of prophecy there that is not recorded as scripture. Likewise, Philip the evangelist has daughters who prophesy, but none of their prophecies are recorded in scripture. So even back in New Testament times, when somebody prophesied, it was not necessarily scripture. And that continues to be true. Whatever you think now of, of people saying, I feel like God is saying this, it is not scripture. We are not talking about adding to scripture. We have a closed canon of scripture. And this might sound totally obvious, and it might sound like it just doesn't even need saying, but I think it is important to say, I'm aware that there are some um, perhaps extreme streams of church where people would say that things that are prophesied are added to scripture and carry equal weight. I think it would be fair to say that all of us in this setting are comfortable that, that the scripture is not going to be added to at any point. We have a closed canon of scripture to use the official term. The difficulty then comes with saying, well, it does, what, what status does prophecy have if it does happen today? Is it that you know, when God spoke in the scriptures, we had to do what he says. But now if he speaks, we, you know, it's like good advice. And I want to say, no, that's not the case. Because he's the Lord. What we're talking about here is about the reliability of transmission. So the first hand witnesses to Jesus testified that the things that were being written about Christ were true, that that was what he taught um, the church over 2,000 years has testified these are the true scriptures. And if somebody gets up in a church the, in this day and age and says, I think God's saying this, it's not subject to that kind of scrutiny. It is not scripture. It's not that therefore 
God is just giving nice advice. It might absolutely be from the Lord. And if it is, we need to take it seriously. But it's not carrying the same um, reliability as scripture and therefore it cannot carry the same weight as scripture. The next thing I think we can all agree on is that God is speaking to people in our community in addition to through the scriptures. And we did a little show of hands um, a couple of weeks back when I last spoke and rather frustratingly because I was on the big screen, I just had a little strip down the side of, of thumbnails. I could only see a few people putting hands up, but pretty much everybody I've spoken to has said that they saw hands waving for pretty much every one of the different ways that I listed. I, I think the only one was nobody waved a hand when I said, has anyone had a visit from an angel? And perhaps that's the one that I'm least surprised that nobody here has experienced. But we had people who would say that as they were praying, they had a strong sense that God was saying something. People who'd dreamed about something that they believe was God speaking to them. Uh, we had somebody uh, giving a testimony that they'd heard an audible voice of God at one stage. So this is happening in our community in diverse ways. And we can all agree on that because I, I think we all trust each other enough to believe this isn't some kind of um sort of delusion i would probably call that or at least some of that prophecy you might not and in some ways i don't really mind what we call it either way it's not scripture and either way we'd do well to pay attention to it and weigh it for its value if we do call it prophecy we have some guidelines for how to use it i haven't got time to go through 1 corinthians 14 this morning as well but it goes through how we should um, use the gifts, particularly of tongues and of prophecy in a church context, in a way that builds the church up and in a way that is orderly and honors God. But we can all agree, there's no new scriptures being written. We can all agree, I hope that God is speaking to our community, to individuals. Um, sometimes that will be for just them, but sometimes in a way that guides us as a community and that we should act on it in a way that honours God and honours each other. Now, that won't totally remove all of our differences, but pragmatically, it should remove quite a lot of them. If somebody in this community feels that God is um, speaking to them in a way that has a bearing not just on their lives, but on us as a wider community, it would be good for us to have a way to hear that to weigh it up so that we're being careful and then to respond. It shouldn't be something where we just immediately say, oh, well, look, so-and-so said this, so let's go and do it. But it should push us to pray, to talk, to have conversations, maybe to fast in some cases, um, to consult with others. And it should, it should push us into a deeper relationship with God, uh, into fervent asking and listening. And the hope is that out of that, we will end up moving forward um, in line with what God wants. I'm going to park prophecy there for a minute and I want to talk about this other one, apostleship. Again, a very controversial one. The title itself, Apostle, is controversial. The fact that it gets used by some people today, um, although I have to say it's particularly common in uh, nations and cultures such as um, African ones. And as we engage with the global church, we, you know, you, you will find yourself engaging with people who would say, I am prophet, whatever, or I am apostle, whatever. And we need to be able to look them in the eye and engage with them as brothers and sisters. So it's probably helpful to have that kind of conversation as well. But again, can we can we establish what we do agree on? Whether or not you call anybody today an apostle or say they operate with an apostolic gift, nobody today has the honour that the original 12 had of being first-hand witnesses to Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. That's, a, that's an honour that was accorded originally to 12. Um, obviously, there were others who were first-hand witnesses. Judas fell away. Uh, Matthias was appointed in his place. And they were called, you know, the 12. They had this unique status and, and nobody else gets to put themselves in that category. Likewise, nobody's teaching today has the authority or the infallibility of scripture. Now, actually, I would say that's not really a mark of an apostle anyway. Many of the apostles didn't write scripture and some of the scriptures were not written by apostles. In fact, we're not even 100% sure who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. So what we're not saying is that anybody today 
would have that kind of authority or that kind of infallibility. But one of the difficulties we get when we unpack the New Testament is that language that was very everyday and commonplace in New Testament times, some of it has become church language nowadays. Apostle just means sent one. And every time that you read the word send in the New Testament, it's the same word as to apostle, if you like. And so we, we put capital A apostle in some situations in the scriptures and in other places we just say to send. And it makes it look as though it's sort of this thing that's only used in one particular way. But for instance, when Paul says, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus, 2 Timothy 4.15, it says, I apostled Tychicus to Ephesus. It was everyday language back then. I think we can probably all in this room, virtual room, agree that some people today do have a call of God on their lives to go and pioneer some new kingdom initiative, perhaps to plant a church, perhaps to start a particular ministry. We heard about Christians Against Poverty just now, and uh, the founder's name has gone out of my head, John somebody. Um, I've got his book up there, but I can't find it in, in time. But I would say personally that he, he had a call on his life to pioneer mission to the indebted and the poor. Now, whether you call it them an apostle or not, they have that, you know, they have that call to be sent. And we can see that gift at work. And likewise, that gift also works itself out, certainly in Paul's case, in having an oversight um, and the, the, the sort of the position to correct and to bring correction and, and steering to local churches within a network of churches as well. So whether or not we call people apostles, I think we can see that gift at work today and we do well to, to welcome it and to accept it. And in fact, I believe we have already sent some people out and I suspect there will be opportunities to commission and send others out because we believe that that's the call of God on their life at some stage. I would love to really unpack every single one of these gifts. It would be a, a long, long talk and there's not time for it now. So as I say, my, my main intent was to take two of the most controversial ones Two of the ones that probably generate the most heat in a discussion across theological differences and to say i think there's a lot more common ground than perhaps we might sometimes think and i believe as well that probably if we take the title out of it and simply talk about the, the substance god guiding people and us responding well to that god calling people to go and establish things and us responding to that then we can, we can welcome those gifts despite the theological differences that we have within the church. And we do well to welcome them because that's part of this full unity that God is leading us into. So what do we do with all of this? Well, I want to bring us back to um, this thing of unity that Paul started us off with because God is diverse and yet utterly one father son and holy spirit and yet utterly unified he calls his bride to be like that as well it won't do just to continue on in in sort of tolerance or um the, that, that kind of low view of unity we want to seek to have a full unity of all the things that God wants to give us some gifts in the church we already have in abundance. One of my first experiences of WCC was the interview day. Um, and as I understand it, it was all pulled together by Jane. Now, I've never had to run um, ad administration for multiple people being interviewed in someone's home. Thank you very much, Cyril and Jen, for putting your home up there um, and providing them all with refreshments and getting them around four different panels. But you know what? That was a gift of administration at work. That was not bureaucracy obstructing the work of the kingdom. That was administration enabling the work of the kingdom. I just give that example because it was one of my first experiences of WCC. I think we would say that we have a good um, a good abundance of the gift of administration, not only in Jane, but in others in the church. There are some gifts in this list and elsewhere in the scriptures that we don't have at all. I would dearly love to see gifts of healing at work in our church today, just as they are in some other places in the world. Now, in saying that, it's true that we have 
seen some miraculous healings, some of us. Um, and sometimes with that immediacy of effect that Jesus's healings had, um, I only have myself a smattering of stories and I think I've only personally been present at one where somebody prayed and immediately something was healed like that. But nevertheless, have seen miraculous answers to healing prayer. And I know that some of you have stories like that as well. But I would love to have somebody in our congregation or a few people in our congregation who had regular faith for that and who regularly saw people healed when they prayed. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in a country where the closest thing we have to a national religion is the NHS, and I say that without in any way denigrating the NHS, who are wonderful, but not God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people said, we've got a wonderful health service, but do you know what? If you can't fix it, you should go to church because there's a God in heaven who can. That story of Naaman, um, the, the Aramean commander, when he goes, uh, he, his servant girl tells him that he can go to Israel and he'll get healed. And he turns up at the palace and the king says, I can't heal you. What are you talking about? And Elisha sends a message and says, tell him to come to me and he'll know that there's a God in heaven. I would love it if people came to church because they know that there is a God who intervenes in healing. Wouldn't that be amazing? Some gifts I think we do have, but we don't quite know what to do with them. Now, I want to include here this gift, whether or not you call it prophecy, the gift of hearing something quite clearly from God that is not necessarily just for you, but for, for somebody else or for the community. Um, perhaps how God's leading us, perhaps something that's coming soon that God wants us to know about, or perhaps something that needs to be addressed in our midst. And remembering that prophets didn't only speak about the future, but very often they spoke about issues within God's people that needed addressing. I think we do have some people in the congregation who already have some of that insight and that, that's part of their regular walk, but we're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, just an example that doesn't put anybody in this congregation on the spot. Um, a few years ago, Simon Jackman um, came along from Oxford Community Church. Andy O'Connell came to preach and Simon came with him. And uh, he had a a picture as uh, he was praying of uh, it was to do with ploughing three furrows and it was to do with the level of activity that there was in the church and we didn't quite know what to do with it as a fellowship and I say we I, I wasn't there at the time and as a result that it's still sitting there on a tape recording somewhere but it's not something that we have taken to heart uh, and talked about and, and done anything about and I believe that if we do recognise this gift that some people seem to have been given of being able to hear quite clearly from God and see something that needs to be um, to be done and, and to step into it, I think if we receive that God-given insight, we'll see the quality of their gift. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 10, 41, if you want to look it up, he said, whoever welcomes a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. There's that expression of faith in saying, I, I do believe that's from God and I do want to be obedient that then brings the reward with it of, you know, of the reward of being obedient and seeing God at work. And all of this leads me back to a challenge that I brought to the fellowship in June 2019 before I was pastor here of how we can receive these gifts as a church. It is difficult, um, but it won't do just to continue sort of pretending that they don't exist or using them without the scriptural protections that we have on them, uh, ha have it happening in a corner in such a way that it's not publicly seen. Th those aren't good ways to deal with this gift or these gifts. And I want to suggest, and this is my, my closing point really, that there is a way forward for us as a community um, that has integrity um, that is biblically sound and that I want to commend to us. Paul finishes chapter 12 and starts chapter 14 with this statement here. I'll just, just read it. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. That's the end of chapter 12. And then he goes on to say, but, but desire to use them in love. And then starts off chapter 14. So follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. And he goes on to explain about the importance of gifts building up the church. 
I want to suggest that a really good response for us as a church would be to eagerly desire a breadth of gifts in our community. And what that means is even if you don't want a particular gift, and that's totally fine, you know, some people might just go, do you know what, never, ever, ever make me a teacher, please, Lord, no. Now, he might have a sense of humour and decide to give you that anyway. Uh, and there are people who say that kind of thing. But actually, it, it's not necessarily just about what you want for you. And that's that's not what this is about anyway. This is not a sort of um, a self-centred personality test type thing. But eagerly desire that our community would have great teachers. Eagerly desire that we as a community would have people working in gifts of healing. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people were showing up regularly on Sunday mornings because they met somebody who prayed for them and they were healed and they said, you know what, this was Jesus. Come and find out more about him. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were people who, when we were sort of stuck of like, how do we even go back to church now? When is it? What should we plan for? Um, how can we plan for holiday club and, you know, X, Y and Z? Um, in this uncertain time, wouldn't it be great if there were some people who had conviction and said, you know what, I, I really feel like God is leading us in this way and we could take it and weigh it up. Now, even if you don't want that gift, wouldn't it be wonderful to pray that we as a community would have it? So the first part of this response is I want to encourage us to pray that God would give our community, our local church, a breadth of gifts and particularly where we lack them at the moment. The second part of that is that we need to then use them scripturally in the way that we're told to. Examples just from this letter, way prophecies, in fact, not just from this letter, because way prophecies comes in Thessalonians, but way up prophecies. If somebody does feel like God's speaking to them in a way that guides us as a church, we shouldn't just take it and say, yes, absolutely, 100%. We need to weigh it. We need to pray about it. We need to talk about other with other people about it. Most importantly, we need to line it up with the scriptures and say, is this in line with God's character and his existing revealed word? For those who do speak in tongues, let's do it scripturally in a way that builds up the body or privately at home. For those who are seeking to uh, work in a gift of healing, well, let's lay hands on people and maybe anoint with oil when we pray, because that's the way that we're encouraged to do it in scripture. Let's teach and encourage each other to use what we have in a way that builds up the church. Just in closing then, there is a risk, and I've alluded to this already, that in identifying our gifts, we might become us-centred. Um, there's also a risk that as we identify our gifts and our, our character, perhaps that God has given us, that we also use it as a cover for immaturity. You know, this is just how I am. Um, I'm grumpy because I'm a dot, dot, dot. Um, you know, I, I'm blunt because I'm a dot, dot, dot. And the antidote for that is for us to ensure that the focus of all of these things is God's glory and the strength and the beauty of his bride, the church. God's glory, the strength and beauty of the church. If we're seeking that, I think we won't become us centred. So let's respond in that way. Let's eagerly desire the fullness of gifts in our community. Let's seek to use them scripturally and let's honour each other um, by nurturing and receiving that breadth. We've done quite a lot of responding in, in quiet or corporate prayer. Uh, this week, we're not going to actually. Jemima's going to introduce a song just now that's a sung response to this. Um, we thought it'd be a different way to, to end this time. So I'm going to hand it back to Jemima now to introduce this song, and hopefully this can be part of our response to this call. Thank you, Al. So um, Jesus calls us to follow him, not to just bask in his generosity, or in his generosity, but to walk with him finding out more about him and finding more ways we can love him and glorify him. So following Christ is a commitment. And like the disciples, we might have to leave some things behind. Jesus said to the Pharisees minding their business and fishermen mind mending their nets, follow me. To the money handlers, the lawyers, 
the intellectuals, the power brokers. Follow me. To the carers and cleaners, the married, the single, the young and the old. Follow me. Then and now, together and apart, willing and doubting, ready or not, Jesus says, follow me. As well as committing to follow Jesus, we must commit to each other, to travel with each other this journey. As Al has mentioned, we're going to sing a song where the words speak about how we should serve each other and walk with each other. You might not know this song, um, or you may feel you can't sing these, perhaps if you're a visitor, but please sing if you can or else listen and read the words. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pray for us all. And then after that, we will have breakout rooms. So I know some of you have to rush away. Um, so if you can stay, please do. It's great to kind of get to talk to each other. Um, but if you have to leave, drop off um, quite quickly and then the, the rest will get sorted out into kind of equalish groups. So I'm just going to pray in closing and then we will um, we'll go to our breakout rooms. Father God, help us to bear one another's burdens at this time when we cannot come close to each other physically. Help us to still keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You see all our weaknesses and strengths, our gifts and abilities. Thank you that you can take all of these and use us in your service. May your name be glorified and may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly and follow you more nearly. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.